All right. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 15, looking at victory of the saints and the glory of God. Rather short chapter, so we'll just go ahead and read that entire chapter, verses 1 through 8. Revelation 15, 1 through 8. Who will grab that for us? Bob. And I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having hearts of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been made manifest. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Okay. So there in verse 1, he talks about, he saw another sign, great and marvelous. Um, he is, of course, with all these visions, he's impressed. This one it uses a little bit different language in the original about him being sort of hit in the heart very hard with what he's seeing in this particular vision. It seems to be more impactful on him. But it talks about these seven angels with the seven last plagues and what is in those plagues or what do those plagues deal with in verse 1. Of course, part of it you, you maybe naturally just understand when you read about a plague. Okay, the wrath of God, and how is that described? There's a sort of a qualifier on there. Okay, there's great and amazing. It's complete. This is the wrath of God, it says, is complete. This is the totality of the wrath of God, uh, which we'll talk more about in a, in a minute, but essentially what it boils down to is this is a full judgment against Rome and against its allies, who of course are the oppressors of God's children. Um, the prior judgments that we read about, they were described as partial judgments. The seven bowls that we're going to read about in chapter 16 that you've studied about you probably notice similarities between them and the seven trumpets. And there's, there's a reason for that, um, which we'll talk about when we get down into it a little bit. But you know, you've got these plagues of Egypt that seem to echo in here. And all it's doing is picking up on this imagery of God unleashing His wrath against those who resist Him and those who hurt his people, who oppress his people. So question one I had asked in verses two through four there, who are the those who are mentioned here, what's their condition and what can we learn from it? So who are these? I saw something like the sea of glass mingled with fire, those who have victory over the beast. What's another way to put that? Victorious or faithful something. Okay, victorious or faithful saints. So you've got the wrath of God being mentioned. These are not the subject of God's wrath. They're, they're victorious. They're, they're in a state of jubilation, if you will. Uh, it talks about this sea of glass. What, 
What does a sea of glass indicate? What does that remind you of? Calm waters. Okay, calm waters. Because sometimes we'll, we'll say if we go out to a lake that it's like what? Glass. It's like glass. So it's not turbulent. It's, it's, it's not churning. It's very smooth. So the sea of glass, but what does it look like? Mingled with fire. What, what could that mingled with fire be? What is fire normally associated with? Okay, hell, very often. Some have looked at this and said, well, this, this is the fiery trials that they've overcome. But since he just mentioned the wrath of God, it's probably God's wrath that they, they're above that or they're separated from that, but the wrath of God is coming. And, and I'll tell you why that makes sense in just a minute. You have something, Rick? I was just thinking, that's kind of the way I see, whenever I see the image of the clear glass smooth and then the fire will be below it being seen through it so that you are actually they're kind of protected by the sea of glass I guess they've transcended so, that yeah that's kind of yeah yeah visual. um does anybody else remember anything in the bible about god's people on the other side of a sea or standing beside the sea and witnessing or seeing the wrath of God. Mike, do you have to? Well, I was thinking about the Red Sea, which was a part of the Red Sea, where they turned around and saw all those Egyptians down there. Okay. Well, when, they, when they looked there, they saw the Egyptians, what did they see? Of course, they saw the, the waters collapse in on them, but then what did they see? I mean, the, the account's very specific. Being washed ashore. Yeah, the body's being washed ashore. So they're they're standing there, they're safe on the other side, and they see God's wrath has, has been brought down on that Egyptian army and it's wiped out. You, you think about that imagery here. Here they are beside the sea of glass, it's mingled with fire. These this wrath of God is coming upon God's enemies. And here they are. What, what happened in Exodus 15? Remember Exodus 14 is where they cross the Red Sea, it collapses in, kills all those Egyptians. What happened in Exodus 15? They sang uh, Moses led them in a song and it was to God. I mean, when you read this and it says Moses' song, you think the initial thought is it's about Moses, but it's not. It's Moses leading them in a song to God, a praise to God. Yeah, the Song of Moses and of what is added in here? And the Lamb. They're singing this victory song of praise to God. It, the, the parallels between what happened back there in the book of Exodus and here are, are to me very interesting, but it, there's a purpose, there's a reason God's using this language here. It's to remind us of what had unfolded and the great victory that He gave His people. I was just thinking, Stephen, as you were talking about numbers and we were talking about the differences and, and looking at this and, and with Moses, Moses was a deliverer, but he wasn't, he delivered them from captivity, but he didn't lead them into the promised land. But as we see, they were all, as we talk about types and shadows, and, and they're limited relative to Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is all things. Right, right. Moses Great lawgiver, great deliverer, Christ the lawgiver and deliverer, but Christ is the basis, being the savior of mankind. Um, Moses' law could only condemn, Christ's law justifies. So, yeah, there's some of those differences there. And he's bringing this imagery in to remind us, here's the work of God, and he's continuing that work. He's going to do that again for his people facing their enemy who are persecuting them. Those seven churches of Asia, as they're receiving this letter, they're reading this and, and they're being reminded, look, God delivers His people. Those who are faithful and true to Him, He delivers them. 
and he has complete victory. I mean, what happened to the to the army of Pharaoh? It was consumed by the sea. What what happens with Egypt as an empire after that? Yeah, it's not what it was before. It it is thoroughly decimated and. Yes, you read about them later in the Old Testament, but they never return to that height of power that they once had. So, here he's giving, giving that idea to them. Uh, any other thoughts there? Well, as we also know, all the nations were aware of that and feared the children of Israel because of the power of God. Exactly. They, they get over there, get ready to go into Jericho, and as Rahab reveals, we're scared to death of you guys. Because we know what happened 40 years before. And so we, we're, the city shut up, we're sealed up, we're, we're on edge because we know you're here, we know you're about to come in. Well, very good. So, as Nancy mentioned a moment ago, here they are praising God, uh, verses 3 and 4. We have a short record of what they're singing in the Song of Moses, the Servant of God, the Song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. And what else? What do they say about God's ways? Just and, just and true. Just and true. What does that mean? Honesty. Okay. It's honest. It's by the facts. His judgments are righteous and they're pure. There, there is no defilement in them at all. Okay, so if, if you've got, let's just say, 100,000 dead Egyptian soldiers floating on the Red Sea and washing ashore, that's a scene of devastation and death. Some of those guys, you know, they were just, they were pressed into service to go for the Pharaoh out to fight for him. Some people would see that as unjust. That what's about to happen to Rome and the devastation that will come upon Rome, upon families in Rome, upon children in Rome. Some people would see that. Well, that's not right. Well, remember who it is that's making this judgment and bringing this wrath. It's God. So it's right. It's exactly right. Rick and... It's just a misunderstanding of what true justice is. I mean, people think justice is everybody getting away and getting off easy. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, it's great to say, as we've been talking about, you know, the righteousness of God was revealed. It always has been revealed. And they were idolatrous people, but they had evidence of what God desired, just as you mentioned here in Rome. They, they were not ignorant of God's will. Right, right. Those Egyptians had gone through the plagues. Yes, they knew. <laughs> and they go out into the desert, answering their mind. Well, and the other thought about that is it doesn't matter why they were in that army, they were fighting against God. Their reason for being in there so, makes no difference. It doesn't make any difference. They, they were idolaters, that's it. Just like going into the land of Canaan. Those people were idolaters. God, God had Israel go in there to purge them of their idolatry. Well, I think, you know, also us trying to explain God's justice also is much like Job and his friends. We just kind of talk about things that, we, that are just too high for us to understand. I don't have to justify why God does what he does. I just know that he did it. And I'm willing to accept that. And, you know, and I do know this, that time and time again, the pattern that is shown for us is that God is able to surgically remove the righteous from the unrighteous. In all of His wisdom, He's able to do that. Even the righteous down though. And yes. Some the, and some of these things that happened, I mean, the, the plagues came upon Egypt. You know, the people of God suffered because of it. Yeah, those beginning plagues before He separated them out, they suffered just as much as everybody else. And, one of the themes in Revelation is you're, you're going to experience great suffering. It's coming. Be ready. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, they talk about uh, verse 4. Who shall not fear you? 
In other words, it should be obvious. Everyone should fear you, God. You alone are holy. Um, you know, let God be true and every man a liar. He, he is all wise, the only wise. It, it's talking about the fact that God is different in character and nature than any other being. He, he stands alone. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. He, he is greater in all, do all praise and glory. Now, um, any other thoughts there? Alright, jumping on down then, verses 5 through 8, what does he see here? See something that he's seen before, but it's just slightly different. <laughs> the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Again, just this idea of the way of God is open. His people are there. They're having fellowship with God. Uh, and out of the temple came these seven angels with the seven plagues. And how are those angels clothed? Pure, pure, bright linen. Okay, pure bright linen, what would that be? White. It's pure. They're holy. They're, they're holy angels. They're on a holy divine mission here. Even though they've got the plagues, they're bringing destruction. It is a divine and holy and righteous mission. Having their chest girded with golden bands. Uh, bowls of wrath and it says these bowls of wrath are full or these bowls are full of the wrath of God so it's interesting to me it says that the angels have the plagues and the bowls have the wrath of God it's almost like there's a mixture or a compound here putting these two things together God's wrath God's fury brings the will the intent the target if you will the plagues are the things that actually come down upon them. It's almost like they're, they're being mixed together and then poured out, of course, on humanity. Um, so what happens when these bowls of wrath are being poured out? Verse 8. What happens or what cannot happen? No one's able to enter the temple. Yeah, till this is done. What, what it's really pointing to there is when these bowls of wrath are being poured out, God's not going to accept any pleas for mercy. These enemies, their, their time is up. It's over. It's time to judgment. And there's no getting out of it. Alright, let's jump into chapter 16 then. And I tell you what, let's take I want to read all of that, but let's just take verse 1 to start with. 16 verse 1, who will read that for us? Go ahead, Chris. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God of the earth. Okay. So, they're pouring these out. We know it's not against the saints, but it's against the, uh, the beast, those who follow the beast, as we're going to see later about the throne of the beast, things like that. Um, there are those similarities between the seven trumpets. But you remember when the judgments came in those seven trumpets that there were qualifiers through there. Do you remember what those were? And there's a pretty common number or fraction given with it? Third. Third. Why? Uh, and the limitation was against certain things, the, the grass and the trees, and, and uh, so there were limits about what they were allowed to affect. Yeah. God was, in, in those previous ones, what he's, he's bringing judgments to try to bring them to repentance. <clears throat> When you go through these, there's not that limitation. There's not that measured wrath. It's full wrath. Just like, you know, here in a little bit, we're going to read about every living creature in the sea died. Not a third of the creatures, but every living creature died. So this, this is describing to us that full retribution 
against God's enemies. Question number two. I tell you what. Let's let's go ahead and read. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and read two through nine. I can't break this up. So two through nine. Who will get that for us? Clint. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his name. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and in the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood and drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just of your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and did what they Okay, so question two I had asked, you know, these force four plagues poured out against nature lists the plagues and their effects. What do we have on these plagues in verse two? Foul and loathsome sore that came upon men who had the mark of the beast and worships his, his image. So it's targeted uh, to those individuals. Uh, what would a foul and loathsome sore be? Is that a corn on your toe, Sadie? What? It would be like the boils that they were covered with in Egypt and that Job was covered with. Yes, exactly right. I mean, this this is this is not what we would typically experience as a you know a blister or maybe even a, a place that's infected if we we got it cut or injured in some way. It's 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 not even like that. But these come and they cover the the bodies of men. It, it's it's very it's extremely painful. Is the idea that it's talking about here? Um, it loathes them. It's gross to see to look at. Uh, to experience, of course. And so that's the first one being poured out upon the earth. What about the second one there? Water turned to blood as what occurred in Egypt. Mm -hmm. It goes on and says the rivers of blood uh, were these who killed the saints and the prophets as he describes here. Right. And in verse 3 there, in that second pouring out on the sea, the blood became as blood of what? Dead man. Dead man, right? I like the ESV in this in this case, corpse. It's got, to me, that gives a little different sense. Yeah, a little more punch to it. A corpse. What, what's the blood of a corpse? What would you think of when you think about that plant? just forgotten and like you've thrown out some kind of meat and it's in the garbage and it's there a little bit too long um, it gets rank if there's blood like if it's hamburger or something especially maybe there's some blood there and it's just nasty well it says the sea has turned to that kind of blood and therefore every living creature has died uh, those rivers and springs then in verse 4, they turned to blood again, echoing that plague upon the Egyptians. Um, and so verses 5 and 6 then comes back with this explanation about it. You know, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is, who was, who is to be, because you have judged these things. Again, it's reminding us 
you know, as bad as these things sound and as what's happening, God's righteous in it. He's right to do it because He's holy and the, these people are involved in sin and worshiping the beast. And then verse 6, there's an interesting thing that's mentioned there. What is it? Well, it explains why he's done this. Okay. So that there is no ignorance on their part, and that he requires them to drink the blood. You've shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and now you've given them blood to drink. What does their just do? Um, did the, really, 16 verse 6 is the theme of the book. When, when you think about that, what, what do you think about God's wrath? God's wrath is inflicted, is self inflicted upon us. I mean, we have to, have to decide whether we want God's wrath or not and act accordingly. What these people have done is they've attacked God's ways, they've attacked His righteousness, they've attacked His children. And so that's why this is the result of that. Right. Is there something else? I was say back in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, it kind of gives an explanation of 15 verse 6, where the angel proclaims and he says, Fall in Babylon. Uh, she who made all the nations drink the wine of passion or sexual immorality, and another third angel follows them with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast, receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, also he will drink the wine of God's wrath. Or full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire, sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark of its name. <clears throat> so you can see there's that separation. There's that torment forever and ever of those who worship anything else other than God. <laughs> And the Lamb is victorious because He's not being tormented. And the holy angels are And so you can see a clear delineation of what's righteous and what's not. Right. Right. And Him pouring out this wrath and giving them things to drink, the wine of His wrath, or as it says here, the blood to drink, for it is their just due. It's, it's almost like God forces their mouth open and pours it down in them. They're, he's going to make them drink this. Um, and think about the way he's described the blood. It's disgusting. You would never voluntarily go and drink that. Although, in our lesson today, well, we'll get to that later. But, the, God is absolutely in a state of fury here. And you want to avoid that at all costs. That you do not receive the fury of God. Logan. Uh, a slight side note here. I think there's an interesting parallel to be drawn between this, this verse here and the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. In that here we see in, in verse 6, where they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Um, and kind of what you're seeing is that the just response to having shed blood is that it's yours to drink now at this point. And then when we take the Lord's Supper, we're taking the memorial of the Lord's blood. And in doing so, we're not only uh, remembering His death, but also at the same time kind of acknowledging the fact that we are responsible for what happened there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are responsible. Yeah, that's a good thought on there. Um, so, Question or I tell you what, let's let's cover eight and nine before we get to the next question. Um, this fourth bowl poured out on the sun, and what what then unfolds? Scorched men with fire. What did they do then in response to that? Blaspheme the name of God. Um, We've all heard of hardened criminals. What do hardened criminals do? 
how do they view their imprisonment, things like that? Somebody else's fault, right? They blame the system. They blame society. They blame their parents. They, they put themselves as a victim here. And that's kind of what these people are doing. They're blaspheming the name of God. Um, well, God, this isn't just. This isn't right. Uh, hardened sinners blame God. They blame the truth. They blame other Christians. They blame the church or elders or preachers. They, some, it's somebody else's fault. It's why I am the way I am, or you're wrong for condemning me for these things. Um, it's no different here. What we see is God pours out His wrath against these people, and they're suffering. They're, they're shaking their fist at God. And that, that to, to us, to most people, is mind-boggling. Why would you sit there and shake your fist at God when His wrath is being outpoured? Um, that, that's, that's what they're doing here. So... Uh, what message is conveyed in these first four plagues? I think we've already said it essentially, but let's just wrap that up. I think Mike said it. And we're seeing the judgment of God revealed, as you had talked about, in its totality, that you know there is no reversing course here. It's not in a partial form as we have noted, but it's the totality of God's judgment. Yeah, and when we enter into sin, there are those consequences, and we will suffer those consequences. Steve, the point that you were making previously, I was thinking about Romans chapter 1, particularly in verse 18, where it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about, they're unrepentant. They suppress truth. They suppress the, the reality of their condition. Right. Their ungodliness and their unrighteous thinking. Exactly. That's how warped they are in their thinking, their attitude, their viewpoint on all these things. So, um, I want us to think for just a moment that society that is saturated with sin is spiritually dead and that's what he's talking about here really describing this Roman society is spiritually dead and so this wrath is coming against him I just want us to think what happens in a society where they're spiritually dead I'll give you the first one that I've got the, the morals decline to a low point morals are just off the cliff right even hung religious people but what else happens in that kind of society What happens with the family? Well, it kind of becomes a, a rat race or a dog eat dog world. I mean, you've got to protect you know, your own stuff like that. And eventually, the family, as you pointed out, starts to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we see in our own society today, and you know, I know I understand this is about Rome, but you know, there are a lot of parallels that we see between Rome. You know, yes. So, you know, this is, you know, again, book written about Rome, but for us also. You know, yes. we see what happens when a nation gets this far away from God. And that's why we have to be um, even louder than what we have been in the past, you know, about turn back to God. Plant and water, plant and water need to be busy. The condition is one that they're not passive, those that are pursuing these things. They're very aggressive. And they want to, again, destroy that which has been, if we will, traditionally established and ordained by God, such as the family. Mm -hmm. And they wish to destroy it, as we saw in Rome, as we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. They're decomposing the family and saying that that structure isn't the only structure, if you will. Right. It's, it, it's actually something that's harmful, they will say at times. Well, there's also a major move to redefine everything. And uh, I've, I've been doing some research because I wondered, deviant behavior has always been defined even by psychology, particularly by psychology. So I'm thinking, what are they teaching now? Because now mm -hmm. deviant behavior is being called normal. Mm -hmm. So how are they handling that? And it's true, pretty interesting. They're going back and redefining all those terms and now deviant behavior 
is being reduced to a very small class of behaviors. Right. You but they weren't a small class decades ago. Right. And, and it's shifting from the traditionally deviant behavior to if you have standards and principles that are anywhere related to the Bible, you're a deviant. You're, there's something wrong with you. Um, so I've got schools breed rebellion. They, they don't teach you know, responsibility, accountability. They breed rebellion. Business, as, business ethics are gone. Entertainment is based. Religion is corrupt. It, it penetrates every part of society. That's what it did in Rome. That's what's happening in our time. Um, and so we, as Mike said, we have to be aware of that. We need to be a leavening influence. We need to be a salt. We need to be the light to try to redeem souls as we can see. I mean, it doesn't take a genius. We can see we are headed right where Rome was here. I don't know how many years off it is, but this is where we are headed as a people, as a society. And we need to make sure we're right. We need to try to redeem as many others as we can as we're headed down that road. Now then, uh, let's just go through these last three plagues here. Uh, let's read. Let's go ahead and do 10 through 21. It's a, let's break that up for the reading. 10 to 16, then 17 to 21. Who will get 10 to 16 for us? Mike. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed God, the God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And when I saw that out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war on the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and all men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. 17 to 21, who will grab that? Logan. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blaspheming God because of the plague of hail, because his plague was extremely severe. Okay, so we have judgment against political and spiritual elements here. And it says that first one is against the throne of the beast. What's the throne representative of? Power. The seed of power here is being brought down. Um, it says this kingdom is covered in darkness. What, what idea would that have if the beast and his kingdom is covered with darkness? What's happening? When we talk about darkness versus light, not talking about the physical element, Good versus evil. Okay, there's good versus evil. And there's another way that we think of it. The absence of God. Well, there's the absence of God. Could it be influence that it's, it's waning at this point? Okay, it's, it's waning. And this, this, one, this thing, and it, and it could be because Rome was considered the light of the world that now there's darkness that's, that's falling upon it. This empire is, is fading, it's turning away. And it can be knowledge. There's light, there's wisdom, and now there's darkness. They, they've lost their way as an empire. Um, they gnaw their tongues because the pain is so excruciating. And then it talks about that the sixth bowl is poured out on the great river Euphrates. 
And what's its intent? What does it do? Why does it do this? Prepare a path. For who? Kings of the East. Remember, we've talked about this from time to time. The Parthians were a very powerful force against the Romans. And here's the idea of this river serves as a barrier. That river is a protector. You think about ancient armies. It took a lot to get an army across a river. And if that's dried up and they can just go right across, that opens up the way. That's the imagery being given here. It just opens up the way. There's nothing standing between them and coming in and attacking Rome. Ron, do you have some? So is this all then in preparation for the final battle? Is that what you see here? Yes. Yes. Every, everything's leading up. There's, there's punishment, punishment, pain, suffering, pain, suffering. And then this way is being opened up. Uh, for this great battle to take place. And, he, and then he talks about these enemies of God. Who, who is it um, that he talks about verse 13? He mentions three in particular. Who are the enemies? 13. Dragon is who? Satan. The beast? It's the beast from the sea. Rome, Roman Empire, the emperor, and false prophet. False yeah, that false the emperor cult, the false religion that that you know supported the beast and everything. So you've got those three there that are together, and it talks about that their spirits like frogs coming out of their their mouth. Um, they're going out, so it's almost like uh, this, these frogs. It's it's trying to give us a, a picture of a grotesque thing. I'm sorry if you like frogs or gross. But these grotesque looking creatures that are coming out as generals to lead this vile army of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet uh, that they're going to gather up. They are spirits of demons performing signs. Um, they're going to perform signs to deceive these kings into thinking we have a just cause or we have a great chance of winning this fight, this battle, things like that. Um, and it says they're going to, verse 14, gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Um, where do we read about this battle in the book of Revelation? The actual battle. They're getting ready here. It's a trick question. We never read the battle. When you get to chapter 19, you only read the results of the battle, which is God wins. Do what? No need to tell us about the battle. No, it's, it's over when we get to chapter 19. So, all right, now, what does Jesus tell the saints to do in verse 15? Watch and make sure of what? Keep yourself here. Keep his garments. What are, what are his garments? It's been alluded to before. What, what kind of garments do they have on? A white robe, right? They've been given a white robe to wear. They're pure. They belong to the Lord. He's saying, you keep that purity. Because if you take that off and you're naked in, in the context here, it's not going to be good for you. you. You need to make sure you stay pure and true. When this comes down, when all of this unfolds, when that battle takes place, you need to make sure you're wearing that because that's the way that you're going to be protected. Um, so they gather together in a place called Armageddon. I asked you to go back to Judges, kind of get an idea. What is this Armageddon? What's it referring to? Okay. Now, Armageddon literally means Mount Megiddo. But there is no Mount Megiddo. That's another thing you get. Oh, that's figurative. 
But Armageddon is not the first Gulf War, or the second Gulf War, or any other war that we're ever going to have here on this earth. Right? What is this? It's a spiritual war that's unfolding. So you've got a dragon, right? Although there's a pretty good argument that there were dragons, creatures like dragons, you know, in ancient times. But anyways. So what, what about this? What was the Valley of Megiddo in the Old Testament that this is pointing toward? This is a place where decisive battles were fought and won. Particularly, you go back to Deborah and Barak and their decisive battle, and they won it clearly, distinctly. And Stephen, doesn't it talk about there were particular times when the kings would come together to go to battle and you know, prove and test themselves? Right, yeah. And this, there were several Old Testament battles fought in this plain of Megiddo or the Valley of Jezreel, all that same area. Wasn't it kind of a, a location where that was kind of a central place where they was coming together? Yeah, it was just, it was a good place to fight. <laughs> it's what it amounts to, but it, it's giving us that imagery of this is a decisive conflict between God's people and God's enemies, His people's enemies. And so, the last one then, it talks about uh, this pour, uh, being poured out on the air and there are these hailstones that are coming down. And how big are those hailstones? Okay, like 100 pounds. Now, just for reference, coming against the air, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about Satan being the prince of the power of the air. So think about that being poured out in the air and this hail comes down about a hundred pounds. Um, can anybody imagine a hundred pound hailstorm? Anybody been in a really bad hailstorm? I'm not talking about like what's around here typically. You know, but out in Texas, Clint? I bought a car that was in a hailstorm. I was the second owner. And so when I would drive it around, people would ask me, what happened? And it looked like a golf ball, but you could see the dashboard, and, and even in the back where the speakers would be, the, the plastic paneling, you could see where a softball-sized hail punctured and went through all that plastic. And so I would have to explain to them what happened to this car, and it was unfathomable because I went through the city of Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1998 when that happened and it looked like a war zone. Mm -hmm. People's houses were in tatters and the vinyl side had fallen off. You know, some of it was still hanging on. Shingles were everywhere. Trees were down. It, it was awful. And uh, you know, glass everywhere because of the broken windows. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get away from it. Yeah, yeah. I've I've seen pictures of military aircraft that were shredded. They looked like Swiss cheese, where they went through a thunderstorm that had hail in it, you know, way up. But I mean, like half a wing missing, and believe it or not, they actually landed the thing. But it just it was completely destroyed. Now we're talking about hail, softball, grapefruit, you know, maybe maybe watermelon. But you think about a hailstone that's a hundred pounds. What's surviving that? It's like wrecking the ball. Yeah, there's nothing that's going to survive that. Like, so you can think of those five-pound bags of ice. Right. You got twenty of those coming at you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So this this is overwhelming. Uh, it talks about every island and mountain were not found. They, they fled away. There's no place of refuge. There's no escaping it. Basically, it's saying you're going to be caught out in the open in this hailstorm. And what are people going to do in the midst of that hailstorm? And the blaspheme God. And that shows you just how thoroughly corrupt and that's the amazing thing you know you would think about things that have happened in our society the damage the pain 
and still people are standing there and shaking their fist at God. We refuse to give in. Yeah, we see everything that's happening, but we just refuse to give in. Uh, it's sad, um, but that's the nature of it. All right, Philip. For some reason, this thing last week in the last for us just reminds me of Job's wife. She just tells me to curse God and die. Just curse God and die. Yeah, just give up. Mike. I was going to say, it reminded me of Pharaoh. I mean, even as the men are around, what do you do with Egypt is destroyed and still he would not Right, right. And then amazingly after that last plague, they're like, mm, change my mind. We're going to try it one more time. And that was their ultimate demise. All right, thank you all.